Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, conservation event. My name is Joe Gorowski from Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants, and I'll be your host for today. It's time for animals to take fate into their own paws. The Endangered is the first book in a thrilling new adventure series by world-renowned environmentalist and Emmy-nominated host of Exploration Awesome Planet, Philippe Cousteau, and award-winning Turbo Racers author, Austin uh, Aslan. We're teaming up with Earth, Earth Echo International World Wildlife Fund uh, to host a series of virtual events this month, diving deeper into understanding of real world conservation and the threats that the uh, species are facing in the first book of the endangered series. So the polar bear, the orangutan, the narwhal, the pangolin, and the black-footed ferret. So I'm gonna bring in Philippe to join us now. He is the grandson of legendary Jacques Cousteau. He's a television host, an author, a speaker, and the founder of Earth Echo International. So a youth organization uh, encouraging kids to get out and do something uh, to play an active role in conservation. So let's bring him in here. Hey, Philippe, how are you doing today? Terrific, Joe. Um, I'm seeing a note here that the audio looks like it's coming through a little bit choppy, but um, look, 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 folks, maybe let us know. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and this is the final uh, one of our series. I can't believe uh, we're already on the, on the last episode. Uh, of a series exploring the the true story behind all the different characters featured in the Endangered. It's the book that just came out with Harper Collins, um, and uh, very excited about uh, about this book. We've just got been getting terrific rave reviews, and uh, it's a it's a wonderful adventure. It's a middle grade reader book targeted, you know, to kids uh, about age eight to thirteen, um, and it's all about a motley crew of endangered species. We got a polar bear. Uh, let's see over here, an orangutan. And um, I think hanging up here in the uh, in the plane, just looking out the window, there is a is a pangolin, and um, and also a, a a narwhal and two black footed ferrets. Um, and so it is a story, essentially like an A team for animals. These animals are all rescued from the wild. They're brought to a secret facility in the Galapagos, where they're administered a special serum that gives them. Um, uh, hyper intelligence. And that's why they're able to fly planes and hack satellites and go on adventures around the world to help protect nature. We have lost 50% uh, of the biodiversity on this planet in the last 40 years. And so we really wanted to create a story that was fun and engaging, had had lots of real information and based on real science, but is a fiction book. That's a great, uh, that's a great adventure. And um, so that's what the endangered is all about. And as part of that commitment, we are uh, thrilled to be able to, to partner with Joe and World Wildlife Fund uh, and other organizations to be able to bring this series. Um, the past episodes are archived. This one, of course, is live today and um, that you're all participating in. Um, but a series that exploring, as I said, the real story behind all these different animals. And while so many of these animals, narwhal, uh, pangolin, polar bear, uh, orangutan are all international animals, you know, up in the Arctic, uh, out in Indonesia, in Africa, in Asia. Um, the two other stars of the team in book one are two black-footed ferrets, and they're a highly endangered species that is here in our own backyard. We oftentimes think of the big animals, elephants, you know, things like that, um, that are the poster uh, children of endangered species. But we maybe forget that there are lots of animals here in our own backyards that are also facing extinction. A thousand, 1,500 animals a year go extinct. And so um, we wanted to put a spotlight in this episode on these extraordinary animals, what's facing them. And we are so fortunate to have um, uh, uh, an amazing, uh, wonderful, uh, committed, uh, dynamic researcher and conservationist, Christy Bly, join us today. Um, because uh, she's going to tell us all about her work with uh, with black-footed ferrets and um, and what's happening, what the future looks like for them, and um, and what we can all do to be part of a hopeful future. So I'm really excited about this, everybody. Um, Christy's fantastic, and uh, we're in for a treat. All right. Well, Philippe, I'm going to tuck you backstage temporarily now, and I'm going to introduce Christy. So Christy Bly is a senior wildlife conservation biologist for the World Wildlife Fund's Northern Great Plains program. So conserving and restoring populations and habitat for black-footed ferrets, black-tailed prairie dogs, and swift foxes in the North American uh, Great Plains. So she aspires to remove the black-footed ferret from the federal list of threatened and endangered wildlife and to restore some connectivity uh, among swift pox our swift fox populations in uh, the Northern Great Plains. So I'm gonna bring Christy in live with us here. 
Hey, Christy, how are you doing today? Hi, thank you so much, Joe, and thank you so much, Mr. Cousteau. It's a real honor to be here today, and I'm really thrilled to be sharing our work with Blackfoot Affairs today, so I'm going to share my screen really quickly here. Okay, hopefully you can all see this, but I'm very excited. Thanks again for having me um, to talk to you about black-footed ferrets today, what they are, where they live, why they're endangered, and what I'm doing for World Wildlife Fund as a biologist to help save them, and also what you can do to help save them too. So imagine, if you will, an ocean of grass stretching across the landscape as far as you can see. Also picture in that ocean of grass, thousands of prairie dog burrows, like the ones you see here in this photo. Not only do prairie dogs live in these burrows, but so do black-footed ferrets, one of the most endangered mammals in North America. Black-footed ferrets are long, slender animals that enable them to easily move through prairie dog burrows. They weigh between one and a half and two and a half pounds and can grow up to 24 inches long. They have a black mask across their face, giving them a mask-like appearance, which is why we call them the masked bandits of the prairie. Historically, black-footed ferrets were found throughout the Great Plains states from Canada to Mexico, um, wherever prairie dog species were found. Um, today, there are about 300 ferrets in the wild in about 14 places where reintroduction efforts have been successful, as indicated by the stars in this slide. Black-footed ferrets are specialized carnivores of prairie dogs. They mostly only eat prairie dogs. They live in prairie dog burrows to escape climate the cold or hot or wet climate outside on the prairie and also to raise young. Um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, prairie dog populations were reduced by 98%. And there are several reasons for that, but part of the reason that ferrets declined were because prairie dogs declined. So that specialization on prairie dogs was a really great strategy until prairie dog populations plummeted. And those three reasons include one, habitat loss. So European settlers began occupying the prairie in the early 1900s, late 1800s, and they began to realize that the prairie was very fertile and that they could grow food. So they began tilling the native grassland and subsequent prairie dog colonies to grow crops for food. And this not only led to the loss of prairie dogs, the ferret's primary food source, um, but then also a non-native disease called sylvatic plague was introduced into North America. And plague is spread by a bacteria that is carried by fleas. And those fleas were on rats on ships that came into the San Francisco Harbor in the early 1900s and spread from those mammal populations in California all the way to the Midwest. And because black ferrets and prey dogs didn't evolve with this disease, both species have little natural immunity to it and they die from it. So it's a pretty severe threat that remains today. There were so few ferrets left in the wild that by 1967, we thought they were extinct. And so they were also then listed uh, on the endangered species list at that point in time. Then in South Dakota, there was a ferret population that was found. And so much like Jill and Hobbs in the Endangered's book, those characters, if you've been lucky enough to read Mr. Cousteau's book, um, they were captured and brought into captivity to save the species from extinction. Unfortunately, those captive breeding efforts were not successful. Um, and at the same time that the captive ferret population wasn't producing young, the wild population died from sylvatic plague. And then by 1979, the last ferret in captivity also died. So we thought ferrets were ext extinct again. 
Then in a stroke of luck though, a ranch dog like you see here in this picture, his name was Shep. And he brought home a ferret to his family in Wyoming. They had a nice big ranch in Matitsi, Wyoming. And that led to the discovery of yet another ferret population. So once again, biologists worked really hard to study that population. And pretty soon it was apparent that sylvatic plague was running through the population. And biologists worked quickly to bring those animals into captivity in order to try to save the species from extinction again. And it was a good plan to do that because by 1987, plague had killed all of the prairie dog colonies in that wild population and ferrets in that wild population also died. But yay, this time, um, captive breeding efforts were successful, thankfully, and there were enough kits or ferret young born into captivity that we were able to then subsequently reduce them, reintroduce them back into the wild. Um, and so in 1991, the first ferrets were reintroduced into the wild into the Shirley Basin in Wyoming. And since then, we've established 30 places where ferrets have been reintroduced. And that's been a great success story to date. And although many reintroduction efforts um, have helped to bring the population back from the edge of extinction, um, we still have a long way to go. So the goal is to restore 3,000 black-footed ferrets in the wild. Uh, and there needs to be 30 populations of those. As I mentioned earlier, we only have 300 ferrets in the wild today in about 14 populations. So there's no shortage of work to do here in order to really save this species and remove it from the Endangered Species Act. So how do we do this? Um, one, we monitor populations of both prairie dogs and ferrets. And two, we address their, um, the threats to their survival today, which still remain sylvatic plague. And then there's definitely just not enough space for ferrets to live. They need a lot of prairie dog acres to survive and there aren't many places with lots of prairie dogs in them left today, but there's still hope. So ferrets are active at night, which means we need to look for them at night by looking for their emerald green eye shine with spotlights and we track them to the burrow they are in. So we can live trap them, so we can protect them against sylvatic plague with a vaccine. So thankfully, there is this vaccine that once each ferret has it, it's good for life. So we like to give one vaccine and a booster, and then they are good for the rest of their life. But every ferret that's born into the wild needs to be subsequently vaccinated. So after we vaccinate them, we release them back into their home, but we also need to protect their prey dog prey from plague. And that's not as simple because there are many, many thousands of prey dogs where ferrets tend to live. Um, and we wanna make sure they have enough, they are, there are enough prey dogs out there for ferrets to survive still. So instead of trying to live trap them all, we put a dust insecticide down prey dog burrows, which kills fleas that carry plague. And we also developed a peanut butter flavored bait vaccine that has the ability to protect prey dogs from plague. And prey dogs love peanut butter. So this has been a successful strategy to help protect them from plague. And we deliver these baits to prey dogs by drone, by all-terrain vehicle. And then once those pellets are distributed to the ground, prairie dogs eat them and then they are protected from plague. And this needs to happen on an annual basis. So it's a lot of work, but it's exciting to have this new technology here to help us out. So now I will play a um, short video for you, kind of outlining some of the work I just talked about, and then we'll keep moving on. Black-footed ferrets were thought to be extinct two different times and have been on the Endangered Species Act for a long time and a lot of people are working to recover them. Ferrets are an obligate predator of prairie dogs. That's the only place they can live and survive is on prairie dog colonies. 
Probably one of the biggest obstacles to ferret recovery is plague because it's highly lethal to both prairie dogs and ferrets, and it can wipe out thousands of acres of prairie dogs in just a few weeks. If we don't protect their prey base, the prairie dogs, uh, they would have nothing to eat anyway. Um, so it's important for us to find a way to manage plague in prairie dogs as well as ferrets. So we developed the vaccine first, and then we started looking for baits that we could deliver it to prairie dogs. And we put peanut butter into it as an attractant for the prairie dogs, as well as mix the vaccine right in. It takes maybe more than 10,000 acres of prairie dogs to support what might be a viable ferret population. And the objectives under World Wildlife Fund and all the partners that we work with is to remove the black footed ferret from the endangered species list. But if we're going to start treating thousands of acres, we have to find a distribution system. And our best idea so far is a unit that will distribute from ATVs, sort of a hopper that will drop one pellet straight down and then shoot one to the left and shoot one to the right 30 feet simultaneously. And I've been able to treat about 50 acres per hour on an ATV. And then the other idea came up with using unmanned aerial systems. There's a lot of places I imagine that are going to be not ATV accessible, and that's where this little guy is really going to show its true worth. So we have load the correct amount of um, pellets. Uh, we'll put the hopper on wheel. We go ahead and click in the autonomous mode, and then it takes off and does its uh, mission. We're about 60 feet up, flying at about 20 miles per hour. So you can watch it go down a transect line on the computer so we get to see exactly what's going on. So uh, every one second it will drop a pellet. Right, so they eat the baits and that immunizes them against the disease. This project has involved so many collaborators, the molecular biologists that created the vaccine in the first place, all the field partners that have helped us. I think it's something like 30 different agencies involved in this project. We've talked a long time about how we would deliver millions of baits to prairie dogs. And so it's been great to see these people get together and really figure out how we could do it. This project fits well with the mission of World Wildlife Fund to use the best available science to achieve our conservation objectives and to bring back the endangered black rooted ferret. Great, Joe, and if I could trouble you to advance to the next slide, please. Perfect, so these activities are all essential ingredients in the recipe of black footed ferret recovery. And we also test innovative technologies like what you see here. This is a thermal camera capturing an image of a black footed ferret kit, a young of the year, um, and you can see him peering out of his prairie dog burrow and basically it collects the heat, <clears throat> the heat signature of the ferret in this image. And so what we see is kind of a darker background, but the ferret itself is about white and you can see his big green eyes there. So this has been a really great tool advancing our ability to find ferrets in the wild because it brings forward the entire animal versus us waiting for the animal to turn and look at us with its green eye shine that we can catch in the spotlight. Um, so using this technology, both the forward looking infrared cameras and the drones to deliver baits, it's, it's not only fun, but really importantly helps us um, find ferrets and importantly count ferrets. So we know how far we are making progress toward recovery. How many ferrets are there in the wild versus how many ferrets we need to reach recovery? And again, if you remember, it's 300 ferrets in the wild today and we need 3000 for recovery. So having our ability to count ferrets accurately is a very important thing for us as biologists. And we wanna make sure we are tracking the health of both ferrets and prairie dogs over the long run. So now that you know more about these phenomenal masked bandits of the prairie, here is what you can do to help them. One, become a black-footed ferret champion. Learn more about black-footed ferrets, their prairie dog prey, the grassland habitat in which they both live, and share what you learn with your family and friends. You could even start a club at your school to talk about black-footed ferrets and learn more about them. There's uh, uh, some opportunities to do that with World Wildlife Fund. Second, 
support endangered species like black-footed ferrets and any other endangered species, especially the characters in the endangered books. Pick one, learn about it, share what you know about it. And part of the reason you can, one way you can support endangered species is by reading Mr. Cousteau's great endangered book. It is super fun. It'll give you a much better appreciation of what the animals are experiencing and how you too can help them survive. Um, and also you can adopt an animal through World Wildlife Fund. And finally, you can get involved in your own neighborhood, in your own community, participate in programs like Earth Echo to help, to help solve environmental issues where you live uh, and to bring some of those issues to bear uh, in light with your community that maybe other people don't know about. So there are many things you can do. We hope that you will work with us to make this uh, a reality that we can help remove the endangered species from endangered species lists and stop the trend of uh, decline of these animals in the wild today. And I'll just finish with a really fun quote from one of my favorite characters in the book. And if you haven't read the book, this is what it looks like. And I'm going to be giving the polar bear here. And she says, uh, we are making a promise to all of our endangered friends, to any animal or species that's in trouble. If you are threatened, vulnerable, endangered, extinct in the wild, if you have a problem and no one else can help, you can count on the endangered. And so, like Nuck, I hope you will join me in helping all endangered animals in our world and make it a better place for all of us to live. Thank you so much. All right, Chrissy, what a great presentation. Thank you so much, uh, especially for the amazing work you're doing on this project. I'm gonna bring Philippe back in here. There we go, the team is back. Oh, Philippe, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you. A little better. Um, Christy, can you hear me? I know we were having a little audio issues there. Is that any better? It's a little choppy still, but hopefully I can make you out. Well, I just want to say thank you. I know we have a lot of questions, so we should jump into those. Uh, I see a lot of text questions here. Um, mostly these are for you, Christy. Uh, I'm just going to step back and, and learn. All right, excellent. Well, let's start bringing some of those classrooms in live here. So I'm gonna grab our first group here. We're gonna go visit Miss Holden. They're third, fourth graders joining from Spruce Grove, uh, Alberta. Let me bring them into the call here. There we go. How we doing, Miss Holden? We're doing just great. We've got lots of questions and lots of people who want a ferret for a pet now. Uh, Lily is wondering about what happens if uh, the prairie dogs eat too much of the vaccine. I'm sorry, I cannot hear that question. That's okay, Christy. They're wondering uh, what happens if the prairie dogs eat too much of the vaccine? Oh, the yeah. They might just get a peanut butter belly ache. Uh, the vaccine is very safe. And so it's okay if one prairie dog gobbles up four or five vaccines and another prairie dog doesn't get any. The, the purpose is that we have enough prairie dogs in an area eating the plague vaccine, then enough of them will be protected against plague. Much like we're doing with flu shots, right? If enough people get flu shots, then we will mostly all be protected from flu. But that's a great question. And there are prairie dogs that will eat more than one. They are pretty, uh, Scooby snack oriented animals. All right, you know, I love that ATV. It really, I don't know, uh, Philippe, if, you're, if your little one's old enough, but mine watch Paw Patrol. And that vehicle oh. really reminded me of Rocky's vehicle that shoots out like peanuts or stuff for animals to follow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, she's, uh, she's 16 months, going on 17 months. So we still don't have her uh, in any screen time yet, but um, uh, I know Paw Patrol, and I know it's a really popular one. Uh, I see lots of questions here on the on the on the chat as well that's coming through. I know a couple. Uh, I had uh, ferrets as pets when I was growing up in, um, and they were so full of joy and so mischievous and fun and wonderful. Um, but I can say that they do indeed. I believe um, Amelia wanted to know. They do indeed have very sharp teeth. Yes. 
Very much so. You do not want to have your hand near their mouth. They are small but mighty, ferocious predators. <laughs> as cute as they are and as curious they are, as Mr. Cousteau said, they are ferocious and they have to be because prairie dogs are also pretty ferocious and ferrets eat prairie dogs and so they have to be that much tougher and they also have to have sharp teeth in order to effectively kill a prairie dog. Um, and, and Chris, I see a couple of questions we could probably knock out quickly and I'm sure a lot of people have. How fast do they run? How long do they live? How much do they eat? How big do they get? Give us a few of those kind of statistics about the prairie dogs. About prey dogs or ferrets? Uh, sorry, about ferrets, yeah. Okay, ferrets, uh, we don't really know how fast they run. Uh, they, they're much more of, um, they're like slinkies. And I don't you guys might be too young to know what a slinky is, but they have this, you know, they're, they're long animals and they do a lot of like dancing instead of running across the prairie. Um, they will, so prey dogs are active during the day and sleep in piles at night underground in their burrows. So ferrets don't have to be fast to chase prairie dogs because they sneak down into the burrows at night while prairie dogs are sleeping and grab one out of the pile and kill it to eat it. So they don't need to be fast to, to eat them. Um, so we don't actually know how fast ferrets are. Um, they still have to be fast enough to avoid other nighttime things that could eat them like great horned owls or coyotes potentially badgers and swift foxes. Um, they are about two feet long. So, it, you know, maybe about as long as an adult arm from fingertip to elbow. And in the wild, they live maybe three to four years, maybe five if they're lucky. In captivity, they can live up to eight to 10 years. And how much uh, will they eat in a day? Oh, right. I forgot that one. So one ferret needs to kill a prairie dog every three days in order to survive. And so moms raising babies try to kill one ferret, one prairie dog a day to help feed the young. Many estimates include that one ferret will eat about 275 prairie dogs a year. So it's kind of a lot of prairie dogs. In order to have lots of ferrets in a site, you need lots of prairie dogs. And one cool thing that I didn't talk about that might be of interest to some of you is that when ferrets are born in captivity, but then released into the wild, they have to go through a boot camp program in order to learn how to kill prairie dogs before they get released. So we know that they will survive and be successful. So that's a pretty fun little fact too. All right, so I wanna give a shout out to um, this is Siemens class in Miami, Florida. Those were some of the questions that they uh, had sent in. We're going to go to Chesapeake, Virginia this time uh, to visit Mrs. Deer's seventh grader. So I'm going to bring her live into the call. There we go. Hey, Mrs. Deer. Oh, we're still, we're still on mute. Yeah, I think she's got it, Mrs. Deer. No, oh, you're still on mute, Mrs. Deer. I think, can you see? It should be something that looks like a microphone with kind of a little slash through it. No? Yeah. I'm trying. We're buffered. Hey, can you, you hear it. me now? You got yeah. it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, welcome to 2020. So we had a question about body plan of the ferret. One of my students noticed it was very reminiscent of an otter. That's very great observation. Um, otters are actually a little rounder, um, not as um, long and skinny, but very similar in terms of structure that way. Um, and ferrets, because they involved living underground in prey dog burrows that are only about four inches uh, in diameter, though they have to, you know, be able to navigate all those long burrow systems underneath, which is why they too are long and skinny. Like otters, otters are pretty aerodynamic because they need to go through the water to be able to eat fish. All right, very cool. I'm bringing in the Keller crew. They're in Hutchinson, Kansas, some fourth graders. How are we doing fourth graders? 
Go ahead, Riley. <laughs> what causes the fur on their feet to turn black? Just like you are born with certain colored eyes and certain colored hair, ferrets are born with black feet. Great question. All right, very cool. Do another one handy, Keller Crew, while well, we got you? Yes, we do. All right. Will two, will two males fight over um, one female? Oh, very much so. You know, they... Uh, they're not, you know, I don't, have you ever watched bighorn sheep butt heads or, you know, deer butt heads? Um, it's a little bit like that, but there's a lot of wrestling. All right. Fair enough. Great questions. I'm going to grab something off of YouTube now to make sure we don't leave out our YouTube crew. Um, okay. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Carcita's group, they're wondering about, do you have an estimate for how long it might take to reach 3,000 or is it just too hard to, to know right now? Hopefully in my lifetime. And uh, I probably have another 40 years before I get too old to help restore ferrets. So I'm hoping in 40 years, but that might be really optimistic. The biggest thing we can do is create space for ferrets on public lands, private lands and tribal lands. And there are lots of opportunities to do so. Uh, we just need to clear some of the social hurdles that might be in the way. All right. Let's bring in Mrs. Resiga's group. They're joining us in Ontario. How are we doing, Canada? Good. Okay. Hayden has a question for you. All right. How many species of ferrets are there in the world? That's an excellent question. So there are three species in the world. The black footed ferret is the only species native to North America, but there is a European and a Siberian polecat in Eurasia. And that the polecats are where domestic ferrets that many people have as pets come from. Excellent question. All right, very cool. That, that surprised me. I thought, I, I'm sure there would have been more than three, but three species, very cool. All right, uh, Florida. We have to go back to Florida to visit another classroom. This classroom's with uh, Mrs. Diaz. Let me bring them live into the call here. There they are. Oh, the devices got disconnected. Ms. Diaz, if you're able to reconnect your devices um, for us, go ahead. Otherwise, you can use the chat bar and send us in some questions uh, there. Yeah, I see a couple of interesting questions here. What sound do ferrets make? What do they sound like? So they have quite a bit of language. They do a lot of um, chattering when they are excited or nervous. They will hiss at you if they are um, wanting some space. Uh, but basically hissing and chattering are the two main forms of communication. And I'm sure there's others that they use among each other that I haven't heard yet. All right. Do they eat anything oh besides uh, uh, prairie dogs? Say that again. Do they eat anything besides prairie dogs? They will opportunistically eat mice or other small rabbits if they can catch them. All right. We've got Miss Diaz's group connected now. Uh, Florida, we're ready for you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sean, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Go ahead and ask them. Unmute yourself and ask. Um, how long is their lifespan? How long is their lifespan? Ferrets in the wild live about three to four years, maybe five if they're lucky, uh, and they will live up to eight to 10 years in captivity. All right, I'm gonna cruise back over to YouTube here and we're gonna grab uh, another question. So uh, as I look for another one, I have a group here who's curious about the color. Why did you choose the color blue for the, the tablets? That's a great question. So we dyed the um, peanut butter baits blue so we could see them uh, once they were distributed on the ground. That bright blue, as you saw, was a pretty good contrast to the prairie dog burrow. But also that has a dye marker in it so we can see uh, through prairie dog poop if a burrow with prairie dogs in it have consumed the baits. So it's a dual purpose there. Fun question. All right, very cool. 
Um, with the ferrets, the black-footed ferrets, and and the the species that are more popular as pets, are there are there much difference between the two species? That's another question that came in via YouTube. They both smell like ferrets, <laughs> and they're both very charismatic and fun to be around. Uh, but yeah, uh, ferrets in domestic life are much more docile and, you know, you can hang out with them, whereas you can't really hang out with wild ferrets so much. You can just get lucky enough to see them outside at, above ground at night. All right. Another fun question here. Um, you know, different groups of animals can have names for, for a group, like a pot or a crash or a murder. Is there a name for ferrets? What uh, is a group of ferrets? Um, you guys tell me because I can't remember right now. That's such a great question. And uh, maybe Philippe can help me out here. But all you smart kids, Google it and let me know because uh, I have to be honest with you. I There is a name for it, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. All right. Well, that's going to be the challenge. Everybody yeah. race to figure it out. Challenge um, to you guys. Somebody yeah. write it in the chat if they come up with the answer. Yeah, we'll see what comes up. Very cool. Uh, give me a wave in your classrooms if you want me to visit. We have a few more minutes. We can squeeze in another couple questions. So if you have something in your classroom uh, you'd really like to get out, let's go back to Alberta. Yeah, and it would be fun to know how many of you guys have been able to read the great book because it's a super fun read. And it's a series. That's right. We have, we're already working on book two. And of course, if you haven't read the book and you're interested, you can go to the endangereds.com and you can find there's some great wildlife uh, uh, in the classroom resources that uh, that World Wildlife Fund put together that you can use to continue in your classroom. Your teachers can use. Um, we've got a lot more resources also at Earth Echo uh, that you can use all about animals and ocean and, and how you can get engaged in conservation. So please, there's more uh, to this conversation going forward as well. This is the last webinar though. We're talking, we maybe do some more of these things. These have been really popular uh, going forward, but of this specific endangered series, but certainly the book is where you'll hear all and be able to read all the stories and adventures that the team undergoes. Um, but everything you need is at the endangereds.com and it links out to World Wildlife Fund and Earth Echo, et cetera. So check that out. All right, Ms. Holden, we're ready for you. I just wanted to put in there that I just told my kids my copy of The Endangered is in and I'm picking it up tonight, so I'm excited for that. Uh, Callie just Googled it and found out that a group of ferrets is called a business. And then the question- Yay, great work. That's exactly what it's, exactly what it's called. Do. Why is it so bad for them? Can it, I think we missed a little part of that question. Oh, a couple of my kids are wondering about the plague. How, why is it so bad for them? Yeah, sylvatic so plague is, um, you know, I don't know, may, maybe some of you have learned about the Black Death that happened in Europe many, many years ago. It's the same disease. It kills people, it kills wildlife. Um, you know, it's bubonic plague or lymphatic plague or systematic plague. Um, and in this case, it's called sylvatic because it's transferred in wildlife. It's It's everywhere, it kills, all small mammals like prairie dogs, squirrels, mice, rabbits, it can kill cats. Um, and, you know, fleas that are infected with plague bacterium can jump onto human beings and infect human beings. You know, how people died many, many years ago was that there wasn't a vaccine or any kind of antibiotic to kill the bacteria. So like flu, it spread throughout people. Um, and, but now today in America, especially, we have uh, antibiotics. And if you were to contract plague, uh, you know, in the unlikely event that you would, you could get um, antibiotics and cure yourself from it. So people in America don't typically die from plague, but it, it spread from Cal the California coast all the way into the heart of North America, um, basically into South Dakota, North Dakota, and that whole area into Kansas, into Oklahoma. So pretty much anywhere prairie dogs live or small mammals live, there's plague. And it's a, it's a really big issue. Um, and it's a big challenge as bi biologists to help understand where it goes when it's not killing animals and how to stop it. It's a very hard challenge that we face in trying to recover the animal to, you know, to recover ferrets today. 
You know, Christy, this is a really important point that you raised that I just wanted to remind everybody, all the students, everybody watching this, your video helped to combine so many different disciplines in science and engineering and uh, uh, creativity. Uh, I think it's really exciting. I hope that all of you are inspired that watched that, that, not sure, maybe you know, you're passionate about animals, not sure what kind of career you wanna go in. There's so many different things that you can do to be involved in helping. I mean, engineering drones, I had no idea. Um, developing camera systems, going out and filming these animals, to doing the science around the vaccines, the, the biological science of the animals, doing the, 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 the research like Christy, like you do, and the conservation biology work. Uh, there's so many different people and so many different disciplines that had to come together to make this project successful and rescue these animals from extinction. That's really exciting. And I hope all of you recognize just how exciting that is so that no matter what you're interested in, no matter what you're passionate about, um, you, you can be a part of helping animals and helping wildlife. Yeah. And that's a, that's such a great point. And there's, you know, mapping GIS mapping. So if you like to make maps, there's a whole world of that available. Um, we have a lot of community landowner groups that we're working with to create space for ferrets. So talking with people and working with people and creating organizations that help to offset the, um, to help create space for prairie dogs in an area. So there's no shortage of really great things. And I hope no matter what it is that all of you want to do, that you do it well and you do it with heart and you find something that gives you passion in life because I've been very lucky in my life to do something that I love waking up and doing every single day. And I hope that someday we can make a difference in the, in the wild and save ferrets from extinction. And I want to remind people, I think there's a few um, adoption kits left at World Wildlife Fund with a signed a copy of the book um, that uh, it's coming up on, on the holidays. So you can also find out more about that through theendangereds.com. Um, but it's a whole kit of, of different things that helps wildlife through World Wildlife Fund, our partner. So I think there's a few of those left uh, as well uh, as another way, you know, supporting organizations that do this terrific research like WWF and, and Christy. Yeah, I do want to share a few more resources here. So uh, World Wildlife Fund, their education uh, page are some great resources, live events uh, with scientists like Christy. Uh, so you can check that out there. And like Philippe mentioned, uh, to find those adoption kits and more information about the endangered, we'll flash that link one more time there. And if you want to catch any of the events, so we've had five amazing events, uh, pangolin, orangutans, narwhals, uh, and polar bears, as well as today's black-footed ferret. You can find it on the Exploring uh, your pants YouTube page, or we have them all on the Earth Echo uh, International YouTube uh, as well. Philippe, I can't believe uh, how quickly this has gone. It seems like we we're just starting polar bears uh, a couple weeks ago, and and here at the end of the sessions. Oh, it's been such a blast, Joe, and and uh, we, you know, we've been so fortunate to have amazing researchers and conservationists join us, like you, Christy, and, and take your time to spend with all of us. I know I feel really lucky that um, that I've been able to be a part of it, and we've had such great classrooms and, and participation. Uh, so yeah, maybe we'll 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 get up to more of this mischief uh, in the new year. But um, uh, until then, they are archived, as Joe said, and there are classroom resources through theendangers.com. And um, so please, please check those out and download them, and and they're they're designed for teachers and, and classrooms um, to use to continue the adventure and continue the exploration of of these extraordinary animals. So before we sign off, I want to bring in a few of the classrooms who are still with us. If you want to get nice and loud, a big goodbye and thank you uh, for Felipe and Christy today. Say goodbye in a minute. Ready? Go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, everybody. It's been so fun. Thanks, everybody. Bye.